Hey, and welcome folks back to another video. So a couple of videos ago, I talked about um, an RC filter circuit. Um, that was in the video where I was talking about how um, how a PID controller works and I coded one up for as example as an example on an Arduino. And it basically was like I had a feedback loop between a um, analog output and analog input on the Arduino. But in the middle there, I had an RC filter circuit, which I then said in that video that I wasn't going to go into in detail and that I would make another video going into a bit more detail about how that filter circuit works. Um, and well, that's this video. So we're going to talk a little bit about how an RC filter circuit works and specifically with the example of say that Arduino that we used, how it can help turn a constantly varying pulsing a PWM signal into a more or less flat DC value, which is what we wanted in the case of our Arduino feedback loop so that the analog read side wasn't just jumping between zero and, and uh, five volts at a certain period. It was actually just giving us a steady value, which was the DC voltage. So I have this circuit set up. This is in Fusion 360 here and we're going to go through how it works. I'm going to simulate it. I'm going to show you the simulations and we're going to build some intuition around how it works. Hopefully this won't be too long. I've been going on a bit in some of my recent videos. So I'm going to try and keep this a little shorter. Hopefully I may fail at that, but anyway, right. So let's jump in. Um, so first of all, this is just a simple uh, schematic diagram done up in um, Fusion 360, which is effectively the electronics portion of Fusion 360 is Autodesk Eagle. So this is uh, the simple circuit diagram you can put in place. If we go to our place components um, menu, the way I did this was all using the built-in NG spice simulations components. So these are all the simple simulation components that are set up that are basically spice ready. So they've got all the, the proper values and everything and all the models are back in those up already. So you don't have to mess around anything with models or anything like that. These will just work uh, straight away once you drop them on uh, with the simulation tools. Don't worry if you've not used Spice before. Um, I'm not going to get too crazy into the details, but effectively you take these components, you can drag and drop them in and you can, you know, connect them with wires and yeah, then effectively they'll just work um, with the NG Spice library. Like, some other components won't work from other libraries because they don't have the spice models backing them up. These built-in ones do. So let's talk then about the circuit that we have here. We have a voltage source here. Uh, this is just a simple DC voltage source that uh, is built in with NG Spice, but you can make these do some cool things with some a little bit of knowledge of some spice stuff. So the uh, value for this is this string in here which you can see is here as well so basically if you type in pulse and then this bunch of parameters this will set up a pulsing uh, signal and that will al allow you to create like a, a constantly varied um, voltage source so in this case we have a pulse that goes between zero and five volts uh what's zero that's the delay time at the start, so there's no delay time. It has a rise time of five nanoseconds, a fall time of five nanoseconds. It has a, what is this? This is an, uh, an on time of 1.5 milliseconds, and it has a um, period of two milliseconds. You can look this up, there's documentation for this. If you just search spice pulse, you'll be able to find the documentation for exactly what that is. I'm just gonna put this back to one millisecond which you'll see why in a second <laughs> so okay yeah so that's our voltage source plus minus and connected to this we've got a very simple circuit we've got two resistors and two capacitors wired up in what we call an rc ladder configuration so effectively this one resistor here and then this one capacitor going between positive and negative is one branch of a filter so then if you combine two of them together, you've got one uh, filter filtering this signal, and then you have another filter filtering the output of the first filter. So between here and here, you've got your output basically is here 
between here and here. That's effectively one big filter, but it's made up of two smaller filters. And the idea is that the first filter does some of the filtering and then the second filter takes off filtering the filter from the first one and so on and so forth. So you can stick as many of these together as you really wanted to, but typically two, two filter, two RC ladders, um, two sets of RC ladders, one after the other is usually sufficient for a lot of different cases. Depends entirely on what you're trying to do in this case. I've chosen two because I want to show you something about how they work, the way it's kind of incremental filtering, each one filters the next thing, um, but you'll see that in a second now. So basically, before I run the simulation, I want to talk just sort of the intuition about how this is going to work. So we know this, this pulse here, this PWM wave, it's going to be a square wave that's going to, you know, have pulse after pulse. Um, the like apparent voltage that comes out of the PWM signal is going to be related to how wide the pulses are. So it's the duty ratio of the pulses. So the pulse goes on, is on for a bit, and then it goes off, and then it continues. So if the pulse is on for longer, the apparent voltage that comes out of it will be higher. So with that in mind, we have this square pulse coming out we effectively on the far side what we want out of that is just a steady dc voltage that doesn't ripple or bounce or you know move up and down at all so we need something that will while it's while the signal is on will have some voltage across it and then when the signal turns off we effectively want something that's going to hold that voltage until it goes on again so you might see where I'm going with this, but that sounds a little bit like what a capacitor does. So if you know how a capacitor works, you connect the capacitor up to a DC voltage. Effectively, the capacitor charges or is, you know, so a capacitor blocks DC. So current doesn't flow through a capacitor in the DC system. But what happens is when you connect it up, charge builds up inside the capacitor and it holds, you know, a charge. So you'll see this in different applications or different things but if you connect up a capacitor to something it'll charge up and then you disconnect it and it can hold charge in it which then has to be discharged sometimes so you'll see um used to be a thing with kind of old school cameras where they'd have these big chunky capacitors in them for the flash um and if you were to taking the camera apart to service it there was a little button you were supposed to press which would make the flash flash, which would discharge that big chunky capacitor inside it. Because if you're messing around inside that camera and you accidentally touched that capacitor, it could discharge into you and give you a bit of an electric shock. And it was a fair belt that you'd actually get out of one of them because they were um, they had very high capacitance. So there's a lot, a lot of energy stored inside them to make the flash um, super bright. So with that in mind, that's roughly what this circuit is, go is going to do. So we have our PWM pulse, which is creating these square waves that go on and off. During the on cycle of that uh, PWM, this capacitor is charging up in, so it's gathering voltage until it reaches, a, 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 basically it's fully charged and it's not gonna accumulate anymore. Then when the PWM signal drops back down again, this capacitor is going to discharge. So it's going to give off some of that charge that it's built up. So then when the signal goes high again, the capacitor will start charging again. When it goes low again, the capacitor will start discharging and you'll get this sort of back and forth um, behavior on the capacitor. So it'll charge and discharge and charge and discharge and charge and discharge. The idea then is that we basically set up the values of our uh, resistors and our capacitors in this circuit so that the rate at which it's charging and discharging means that we get this solid value the whole way across that doesn't dip or anything like that. And we can tune that by changing the values of the capacitors essentially. So if you had uh, capacitors with very, very low capacitance, they would charge very quickly and they discharge very quickly as well. So depending on the frequency of your PWM signal, which for an Arduino is 490 Hertz, you may, it may be the case that you've charged your capacitor, your PWM signal goes off, but your capacitor discharges very quickly and the voltage then just drops back down before the next PWM pulse is able to hit. So in that case, you'd actually want a larger capacitor to be able to hold more charge, to be able to basically persist 
that voltage for longer. So, okay, I've said a lot there. Let's have a look at something. So I'm going to go up here to the simulate uh, toolbar and I'm going to hit the simulate button. I'm going to do a transient simulation, which will run over a uh, course of, I think this is, yeah, a 0.2 of a second. I'll hit simulate. Ooh, and there we go. Okay, so this is our at the output of our simulation. Um, so what's going on in here is uh, I've only put one probe on it. So this probe is effectively just looking at the output of our PWM signal. So we have a voltage up here. It's five volts for 0 0.2 seconds. Then it drops to zero volts and that moves on. Oh, wait, sorry. What's the period for this? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 sorry. Doesn't matter. The period doesn't matter. Let's forget about that for a second. <laughs> I misspoke a bit. Let's just look at all we're interested here is that we're on for half of the cycle and then we're off for the other half of the cycle. So yes, so between 0 0.2 and 0 0.201 and then 0 0.202, <laughs> we have our pulse. And for half of the time, it's on. For half of the time, it's off. So for what we know of PWM, this is a 50% duty ratio PWM pulse. So the output apparent DC voltage should be about two and a half volts is what we're expecting to get out of this. So what I'll do now is I'm going to throw some probes onto our circuit and see what those outputs look like. So I'm going to put one here after the first, um, at the output of the first filter, and then I'll throw one on the second filter output and we can see what the differences are. So if I close this and go back to here, I can set a voltage probe. So I'll set one there for a V1. And let's actually just simulate that now on its own. Same thing again. And there's our simulation result. So you can see here that we've got our square wave, <clears throat> which is going from five volts to zero volts, five volts to zero volts. And we have this V1 voltage here, which is the output voltage here of the first filter. So you'll see that our first filter, while the voltage is high, so the PWM pulse is high, we get this voltage increasing. So it increases up to a peak somewhere, was it about uh, 2.94 volts, so nearly three volts. Then our, um, our PWM pulse goes low. And now we start to see that that voltage starts dropping. So this is basically the capacitor discharging. The capacitor discharges and it goes down to a low of about two volts. And then the PWM impulse goes high again and we see it starts charging up again. So you can see we were supposed to have a flat voltage of about 2.5 volts. But instead what we actually have is this sort of almost kind of triangular wave that starts at two volts, peaks up to three volts, and then goes back down to two volts again. So it should seem obvious that the average value pretty much across that is more or less 2.5 volts because we go from two volts up to three volts, back to two volts again. So the straight line sort of approximation to that is about two and a half volts. So you can see we're getting a little bit closer to what we wanted. So, okay, let's now look at the output of the second filter. Close this down. I'll add my other voltage probe here, V2, and then I'll hit the simulate button again, simulate that. And here we have oh, the output of our simulation. So in this case, we've got three signals now being plotted out. So we have our uh, PWM signal, we have our first filter output in green, and then in blue, we have our second filter output. Oh, geez, didn't mean to do that. Oh no, what have I done? <laughs> I zoomed in too far. Hold on, I was gonna kill that and run it again because this is this thing with this tooling, it can be a little bit tricky to mess with sometimes, so. Okay, anyway, back to where we were. So we have our first signal, we have our constantly varying signal, our little kind of ripply one, which is our first filter output. And then at our second filter output, the blue line, 
you'll see we pretty much have a flat DC value, which is more or less at uh, two and a half volts. So it does change slightly. You'll see it has a little ripple. So at the start, it's 2.48, and then it climbs a bit to 2.52, and then it goes 2.53, 4, and then it goes back down again as it goes on, back down to 2.48. So there is like a tiny little ripple in it, but I mean, within margin of error, I'm calling that basically 2.5 volts consistently. But the thing with this is you can't tune it. So you can change these resistor and capacitor values and you can try and get that lower and lower and lower. But yeah, effectively, this is our RC filter circuit. So we have our, our big changing pulsing PWM signal. We have the first leg of this filter. And the output of that ends up being this sort of small-ish changing pulse that kind of looks sort of DC. And then that becomes the input to the second filter. So the output of the second filter then ends up being more or less a flat DC value. And that's about it, really. That's kind of <clears throat> as complicated as it gets in terms of, well, this is a DC low pass filter. So if you want to learn more about that in general, there's a lot of maths, a lot of theory you can go into about these. You can tune them to cut off at particular frequencies and stuff like that. This is basically just trying to give me a basic flat DC signal out of it. I think I was just giving you a basic overview of an intuition about how this sort of works and how you can use it. Um, for example, I use this pretty much this exact circuit um, a good while ago. You see it in one of my old CNC machine videos where I had a speed controller for a DC motor and it came with just a potentiometer to change the speed. I didn't want that. I wanted my um, CNC machine to be able to change the speed using a PWM pin from its control board. The only trouble was the speed controller didn't like a PWM control signal. So what I had to do was I had to make a little breakout board, which was just whatever fil whatever resistors and capacitors I had lying around, made a little DC filter so that my PWM went into that. And then the filter DC approximate value went into the speed controller and it worked, <laughs> which... I was very happy with myself at the time because I applied something that I knew abstractly from, you know, uh, electronics and maths. I was able to build it, apply it in a place where it actually worked and solved the problem that I was having, which almost never happens. <laughs> so anyway, I hope I've given you enough information that you might be able to have this in the back of your head so that if something like this comes up in the future, you'll remember it and be able to apply it yourself. Um, I haven't gotten into huge detail. There's so much detail you could go into uh, on this. But I'm going to cut it here. Uh, I'm just under the 20 minute mark and I'm going to leave it there. It's still a little longer than I wanted to, but I hope this was useful for you guys. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to get back to you. Um, if you have any really specific questions, maybe find a better expert for them, but I'll try my best to answer anything that comes my way. So yeah, that's about it. Um, thanks for watching, guys. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.